Mike Young, and I'll be hosting this webinar today on understanding the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist. Uh, I just want to confirm with anybody if you can do a quick uh, confirmation that you can hear the volume and it is at a usable level. Uh, we had some issues in the first webinar, but I've switched around the processes that we're using, so I'm pretty sure we shouldn't interact in with any problems. And we do have some confirmations. So, yeah, we're good to go. Excellent. So as I mentioned, today's webinar is on understanding the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist. The checklist was developed by the United States EPA in 2006, and while it isn't a requirement in Canada, I really feel it's a useful resource and uh, definitely something that's usable by all uh, people involved in the green building and just general building uh, industry. Uh, apparently, uh, Ralda has a question. I, there is a question pane on the uh, side of the GoToWebinar software. You can just type in a question. I can hopefully uh, see what it is and answer it for you. If it was just an audio issue, oh, uh, maybe it's not going through. All right, we'll just go through. And if you have any questions, please, uh, my email contact will be listed at the end. You can send me any, any questions, and I'd be glad to answer them for you. Uh, so just to get quickly started, uh, today's webinar um, is being sponsored by Natural Resources Canada. Uh, Natural Resources Canada is the governing body over the Energuide and Energy Star program in Canada, and they have made a financial contribution to City Green to perform these webinars to act as an educational proxy uh, on what's going on in the green building world and the Energy Star and Energuide programs to let the builders, developers, municipalities, local governments, and pretty much everybody know a little bit more about what is going on and how they can use these programs to better work within their own mandates. In today's uh, presentation, we're going to do a quick introduction to City Green. Uh, I'm going to talk about where you can find the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist, what's in the checklist, uh, the Energy Star for New Homes program, which, as I mentioned before, the checklist isn't a requirement for, but it will certainly go a long way to helping you to reach the, the requirements of the Energy Star program. Uh, the rebate programs that are out there, there are a number of them, and I'm going to quickly whip through them. But again, if anybody has any questions about them, I'd be glad to answer them after the webinar and uh, talk about some future presentations and webinars that we will be doing. Uh, this is a series of four webinars. This is the second of the series. If anybody would like a copy of the first one, which was on the top five technologies to cost-effectively increase your undergrad scores, I did do a recording of it. The audio on it isn't fantastic, but it's certainly usable, and I'd be glad to pass it along. Uh, and uh, we do have two more that are going to be going on in the future that I'll be talking about at the end of the presentation. So just to quickly hop into it, uh, I am a certified energy advisor for new homes with City Green Solutions. And City Green Solutions is a nonprofit, and uh, our basic mission statement is we are uh, here to excite, inspire, and lead British Columbians into taking both simple and extraordinary actions to reduce energy usage in homes and buildings. Now, that was our original mandate, but City Green has diversified in the last little bit to really uh, try and go all over the spectrum of energy and water efficiency. Uh, we do energy modeling for new and existing homes. We do energy assessments for commercial and institutional buildings, as well as diagnostic services like thermal imaging, uh, sustainability assessments for businesses, energy management, uh, education and research, and uh, just like this, this would be one of those examples of the educational work that we do. Um, now, this is uh, the, the cover page of the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist. It's just you know, a basic document, it's about 70 pages long, and as I mentioned, it's very digestible for the average reader. You don't have to be a home builder to really understand what's going on in it. It uses a lot of pictures, a lot of reference material, and uh, overall it's a very usable document for all levels involved in the building sector. Um, where can you find the Energy Star Checklist? Well, it is available for free, offered through the uh, Energy Star program in the United States, the EPA, at energystar.gov. What I'd highly recommend, the easiest way to get this document, is just in Google type in Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist Guide. And it is the first document that comes up. It's available in PDF. You can save it right off of the site for free. If anybody has a problem accessing this document, I have it saved on my desktop, and I'd be glad to email it to you. It's only 2.5 megabytes, so it is able to be emailed in a standard uh, email uh, without any issues with IT worries. Although saying that, definitely IT worries will occur from it. So um, what is the purpose of this, of this document and what does it do? Well, the document is focused on reducing bypasses. And bypasses is a term that was made up by weatherization contractors to refer to convection pathways that occur within hidden locations within the building. So a bypass uh, going through the air or thermal envelope of the building. Um, 
in the early days of this checklist, a lot of people did have issues with calling it a bypass and making it a, con a confusion of what an air barrier is and what a thermal barrier is. So it, while it isn't the best possible term for what the checklist is trying to do, it's certainly a usable term and relatable for contractors to find where air and heat and energy is being lost in a building. Um, the, the list has certainly grown. Like I mentioned, it was originally developed in 2006, and it has been updated a number of times. Uh, the last update was in 2012, and it just was basically uh, boistering it a little bit to fit for more changes within the building industry. Now the checklist includes things like insulated concrete form foundations, it includes SIP panels, and as well as just standard construction, but it also goes to account for non-standard construction, like double walls, which you don't, we don't see often here in, in the West Coast, but certainly in the interior of the country, it is something that should be considered because double walls are a great way to increase the R value of a wall without having to use too much technology. Uh, it is a checklist. At the end of the guide, there is a 16-point checklist that builders can use and highlight. Uh, the point of the original checklist was for certified energy advisors or in the United States where the checklist was developed, HERS raters, to look at a building and, and really work with a builder to say, have you looked at all of these locations to see if you've verified an effective thermal envelope? And can we, can we point out these locations that is very common for air and heat to be lost by? and see if we can help you and educate you on how to prevent these air leakage and heat losses occurring within the home. Uh, and it is a guide. The whole document is very usable. It's filled with pictures about what you can do. I'm going to go through a few examples later in the presentation about what I think are really the most, uh, at least from what I've seen in construction in BC, what are the areas where builders should be most concerned about. Um, and uh, it has key points about installation criteria, and the best thing about it is it has tips about, okay, yeah, this is a problem, but here is, here is a nice, easy solution for you to consider. Uh, it's not just saying these are things you need to worry about. It's these are things you need to worry about, and this is what you can do to correct the issue. And it's, as I mentioned before, it's a resource, not a requirement. In BC, there is an Energy Star for New Homes program, and in the United States, the Energy Star for New Homes program does require this checklist but not in BC. It's just a great guide that you can use to look at and find what is going on in your building and where it's possibly, uh, where you could possibly improve the condition of your thermal envelope. Uh, who can use it? Definitely architects and designers can take it and read through it. It's, it's a, a very quick thing to go through and they can see where the thermal barrier is occurring and really make the, the, the builder that they're working with in the project aware of these areas that the builder should be concerned about. And, and builders definitely can read through the document and coordinate with their framing and insulating contractors about how to maintain and ensure the air and thermal barrier is continuously installed and maintained through the whole build. I can't count the number of times I've seen an, an electrician go into a home after a home was very well air sealed just to dash apart a vapor barrier or an air barrier to get their uh, wiring into place. It, it's a, it's a, a whole team process that needs to be done and when everybody is making a, a point to maintain a continuous air and thermal barrier, everybody has to work together to do it effectively. Uh, site supers, absolutely, they should probably be the most important people to read this thing because they're the people who are on site every time maintaining and, and, and watching as these air and thermal barriers are established. And they're the people who can definitely say, hey, you know, you have to be more careful with this kind of thing. And then certified energy advisors as well. I can see that we have a few on the list that have showed up from the interior, from Vancouver, from Up Island. Uh, certified energy advisors definitely should be reading through this list and, and offering it as a resource, because it is a free resource, to their builder and saying, hey, you know, look through this checklist. It's got a lot of useful things that you can find, and it's, it's very easy to find where these things are going on. And if they're happening in one of your homes, chances are they're happening in every home that you build. So what's in the checklist? Well, there's six main chapters to the checklist. Uh, the first one is going to be an overall air barrier and thermal alignment, then talks about walls adjoining exterior walls and unconditioned spaces, which is a major air leakage location. 
Uh, floors between conditioned and unconditioned spaces is also very important. That would be things like garage uh, walls or exposed floors uh, under a carport or something along those lines. Shafts, like uh, chimneys or electrical shafts, uh, with the new requirement uh, from the provincial government and a number of municipalities signing on to having mandatory uh, ducting or, or piping for future solar installations. There isn't anything explicitly in the checklist to account for that, but definitely the section on shafts does give you a bit of indication of where areas are going to be occurring with this new, a new uh, bylaw for solar ready and what you can do to uh, prevent air and, and energy from being lost from that new requirement. And then as well as the attic ceiling interface and common walls between dwelling units. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the common walls between dwelling units. It's a, a little bit of an area of concern. Natural Resources Canada is making new requirements for different testing for adjoining buildings, but in this presentation, we're just going to focus on the top five uh, things that are in the or top five chapters in the checklist. <coughs> so, again, the 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 really base level of energy efficiency, and one of those things that I always like to tell a builder is when you're thinking about your air barrier and your thermal barrier, what you want to do is you want to take a look at your house plans. You want to put a pencil on the page and you want to draw a line along the whole building envelope. And you should be able to draw a line along where your thermal area or thermal envelope is and not take your pencil off the page. Because if you're taking your pencil off the page, that means there is a break, that means there's a bypass, and that means that energy is being lost in that specific location. So if you can take a pencil and put it along your drawing, and not take it off, that means you probably have a continuous air barrier and a continuous thermal barrier. And, <clears throat> and that is the key to energy efficiency, not letting the heat out of the building. So we're going to go through five quick examples uh, from the list that I have commonly seen in BC construction and uh, Ontario construction as well, because I did do some work there as well. Um, the examples that I'm going to go through are from the list. They're pictures. Most of them, most of the pictures that I have in this uh, presentation are taken from the list. Some are from thermal imaging assessments that we've done in the past that just are slightly better pictures or, or maybe highlight a little better how bad things can be. So the first thing I want to talk about is the walls behind showers and tubs. Now, if you've ever gone into a house that's during framing stage, you'll see that one of the first things that goes into a building after the framing is complete and the windows are in is the bathtubs or the shower uh, surrounds or whatever they may be. And often they go in before any installation, any, any insulation is done. And the big problem with that is you have this, maybe it's only a two by four area, but it's enough area that you have a area without insulation on your exterior wall and it really reduces the effective R value of the whole wall. And another thing is it's going to affect comfort. When you're dealing with a bath, generally you want it to stay warm. If there's an uninsulated wall right attached to your bath, that bath is going to cool down a lot quicker than it should, reducing the comfort for your occupants, reducing the comfort for your clients. When you're dealing with properly insulated walls, the, there's not going to be a, a, just a heat sink pulling heat out of your tub or out of your shower. Now, this is a great thermal image that is actually taken from the checklist. You can see in the picture here, there is a huge just reduction and, and pulling of heat out of the area right along here. Now, if this was insulated, you'd be dealing with a more even heat tone. Uh, with thermal images, the darker the image, the colder the area is. And with this one, we can see there is a major drop in heat in this area here. And that's most likely due to the fact that the insulation or an end air barrier wasn't continuously installed behind the tub. Now, when we look at something that was done correctly, we can see right here, these images have a rigid board installed. They've been air sealed to prevent air from getting through, and even a batting installed as well, just before. You know, you get one package of batting in before your insulators come in. You pop it in, then you pop in your tub, and you have a continuous thermal barrier. And then later when the installation of the the rest of the insulation for the room is being done. It's, it's not a concern. You just add more insulation to the rest of the area and you're good to go. It's a much, uh, it's, it's something that builders should be concerning themselves with. I know a lot of builders are doing this, but the reason that it's in the checklist is because not all builders are. And this is something that definitely I feel is probably the most important area for people to be concerned with. Uh, another big issue that we see all the time is skylight shaft walls. Um, 
Now, often skylight shaft walls will be insulated, and, and that's a pretty common practice. I don't think I've ever actually seen in, in the field a skylight wall that wasn't insulated. But often we see skylight walls that aren't air sealed. And without an air barrier, the insulation, it does have an effect, but it definitely loses effect. And uh, in the actual document, there is a great image that shows a, a thermal image of air coming through a skylight shaft. And when there's no air barrier, you're, you're dealing with a lot of air leakage occurring. So by installing an air barrier as well as insulation on the actual shaft, you're, you're getting a great, great performance boost in the process without having to add too much cost. The, the, the area of a skylight shaft is quite small, so the process of adding an air barrier to it is a, a relatively cost-effective method to improve the air leakage scores in a home and reduce the thermal or, or the, reduce the air barrier envelope uh, leakage. Another big area of concern is insulated floors above garages. Um, with this picture here, what we're seeing is the insulation, most likely a batting, uh, being drooped down onto the garage ceiling, most likely some type of drywall product, and then above it being uh, probably a half-inch OSB or something along those lines. A lot of builders are going the route of spray foam for garages these days just for the, the potential of health concerns with uh, exhaust gases from cars. The, use of spray foam definitely reduces it to pretty much zero chance of air uh, escaping into the home envelope. But when you're dealing with batting, which is a much more cost-effective option, just ensure that the batting does fill the entire cavity. Uh, if it doesn't, you use, uh, use additional batting. Use uh, a rigid board as well. Use a, an inch of spray foam. And then, well, if you're using spray foam, you should generally use two inches as a minimum because that's what is going to be enough to count as an air and vapor barrier. But uh, use, use enough insulation to fill the cavity to the absolute full void. Now, we can see here another picture of a webbed uh, truss system. When you're using these kind of things, again, just ensure that there is a continuous air seal around all of the edges, um, and, and that's, that's your best bet. Uh, insulation is important, but air sealing is, is the absolute requirement when dealing with insulated floors above garages, not only for health concerns, but also energy concerns. Another area that I think uh, probably is the most embarrassing that I, I come across is attic access panels. Uh, this is an image that our thermographer Torsten took of a new home with a, an attic access panel. And you can see on the uh, left-hand uh, side, the thermal image is just a, a complete leakage area. Uh, what should be, be done in this kind of occurrence is with having weather stripping along the ac ac attic access panel. Um, what, what I typically recommend, actually, to, to homeowners uh, for retrofit applications is, are you using the attic for storage? No, most people aren't these days. It's, it's, it's dirty up there. Nobody likes going up in their attic. Why not just caulk the attic sealed and, and just have it sealed? There's caulking that you can get that you can pull away pretty easily these days. And in the event that you do need to go up there to do some maintenance, you can get into it pretty easily. But have it completely sealed. And if that's not the case, you do want to use it for storage, get some type of latch device to have a tight seal on the attic access panel. And the other consideration is if the attic, attic access panel isn't insulated, uh, when we're dealing with non-insulated ac attic access panels, or just you know some builders will have that sheet of drywall and then a uh, inch and a half or two inch rigid board attached to it. That's only R5 to R7 and a half. Uh, when you have a let's say in this case a four square foot area of your ceiling being R5 and the rest of your attic being R40, the effective R value of your attic is dropped down significantly when you have the reduced insulation value. Heat doesn't go in all areas evenly. Heat takes the path of least resistance. It'll go wherever it's easiest for it to escape. And that's why you want to ensure that you have as much insulation on your attic access panel as you have in the rest of your attic, or at least as much as you can reasonably put on. Another big area of leakage concern is recessed lighting fixtures. Uh, these images here just show how much air is escaping 
through these recessed lighting uh, pot lights. Uh, very common in installation all over the province. We see them in pretty much every new house we deal with. One of the things that I do when I'm talking to a builder and he's concerned about his air leakage, I say, okay, well, how many, air, how many pot lights do you have in the top floor? Or how many pot lights do you have in the whole house? Because if you're concerned about air leakage, when you have pot lights, that's what you need to worry about because they are where air is going to be leaking through your house. There are ways to deal with it. There are proper pot lights you can get, but general out-of-the-box construction, when you're dealing with pot lights, they are leaking like a sieve and they're something that you can, you can effectively deal with. There's a couple options for you. Like I mentioned, you can get pot lights that are designed with airtight gaskets and, and systems in place to prevent air leakage from occurring. They are more expensive, and that definitely is a reason that a lot of builders don't like going for them. But uh, when air leakage is a concern, uh, these gasketed pot lights are an excellent option to ensure a tight building envelope. Another option that uh, definitely is less commonly used is to uh, reduce or, or have a separate uh, area for the pot lights, drop down the area, or build a box above the pot lights in, in the attic. With, with drywall or some type of air barrier medium and seal it off there and have gaskets for the wiring going through. Overheating isn't going to be an issue because they're venting below and you have a great system. Um, with this picture, which is taken from the Energy Star checklist, it's dropping down. Most builders probably wouldn't want to do that because you're losing interior space, but definitely the, the option of building a box above is always there and depending on the lighting and system design, it's, it's generally pretty cost effective. I would highly recommend this, uh, this kind of option when you're, again, concerned about air leakage through pot lights and there's no other options available. Um, now, one of the, the great things to do is, is combine the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist with thermal imaging. Uh, Pre-drywall thermal imaging and post-drywall thermal imaging as a, a quality assurance kind of process is, is a great method as, as a diagnostic tool. Uh, infrared images help reveal thermal bypass in, in real time. Um, whenever I'm talking to a builder about thermal imaging, I, I say, you know, it's, it's a diagnostic tool, and if you're interested in doing this, it is for this individual build. But everything you learn from the thermal imaging process, you're going to be able to apply to all of your future homes. When we're dealing with thermal imaging, when we're dealing with air leakage, when we're dealing with bypasses, things that are occurring in one home that you build most likely occur in every home that you build. So when we do this thermal imaging, you're able to quantifiably show where air leakage is coming through and at the same time find out what you can do to fix that issue. Uh, there are a number of companies that do offer thermal imaging in the lower mainland. Uh, on Vancouver Island, there's a few. In North Vancouver Island, I know of at least one. A lot of building inspectors are getting on board with them. Mike Holmes is even a big fan of thermal imaging. It's definitely something that I think is going to be taking off as more and more building codes put air leakage as a, a caveat and requirement into the process. Um, so what, what can this tight building envelope get you? What's the point of all of this? Well, uh, if you have a tight building envelope and you're following normal building practices or building codes, especially in the city of Vancouver with the increased building code, if you have a tight building envelope, you're most likely going to get an above Energite 80. That's going to get you a bunch of the rebates that are out there that I'm going to talk about in a bit. It's going to allow you to access the Energy Star for New Homes program, which is a great marketing uplift. Uh, the Energy Star symbol, uh, Natural Resources Canada did a study on it and found that 90% of Canadians are able to recognize the Energy Star symbol just, just at a glance. Uh, and 70% of Canadians agree that they, they feel better about purchasing Energy Star products, thinking that they're helping the environment. Energy Star is a new program for uh, homes in BC. Uh, it uh, was originally launched in 2011, and it's been going on uh, for uh, about a couple of years now, and it's starting to pick up steam. Um, through our organization, we've rated about 12 homes, but I do know that there is uh, a whole track development in the interior of BC that has gone Energy Star, and it's, it's really starting to gain a lot of ground. It's a huge program in the United States. Over a million homes have been labeled, and it's a pretty big program in Ontario and Saskatchewan as well where there are uh, 22 to 26,000 homes in Ontario that have been labeled as Energy Star. Now, this is a development that was built in View Royale, BC. It was a townhouse development, a luxury townhouse development, 
And when the builder w was looking into what he could do to stand apart from another townhouse development that was going up the road, he thought, well, Energy Star is uh, promoting the best in class. And that's really the way I wanted to build my home. So he went that route and was very pleased with the result of the process. Um, to meet Energy Star requirements, they recently did update the Energy Star program. Uh, it became a lot more stringent in December of 2012. And I'm actually a pretty big fan of it. Uh, for the minimum requirements, uh, like uh, most things, it requires an Energuide 80 uh, at least as a minimum. Uh, but they added in an air leakage requirement, which we will we'll tie back into this Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist, which will really help you reduce your air leakage. In a single family dwelling, you need an air change rate of 2.5 or lower, or for an attached home, of 3.5 or lower. Uh, effective R values are based on the climate zone. For the uh, lower mainland, uh, is probably a R value of 17.5 and an attic of 49.2. Uh, that would mean you can't use a code constructed wall for 17.5. You're going to need either an R22 bat or you're going to need some type of uh, additional technology, either exterior insulation, 24 inch spacing. Um, it, there's a lot of options that are out there, but something beyond code value would be required for 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 building a wall of effective R17.5. Uh, the Energy Star program also requires Energy Star qualified windows and doors, uh, recognizing that a lot of homeowners like a beautiful wooden door as their entryway. You're allowed one exemption door, uh, and that can be your entry door or garage door, or whatever you really feel like. But most people choose to go for their uh, entryway door. It also requires spark ignition fireplaces if you have a natural gas fireplace, and 75% of your lighting to be Energy Star qualified. Uh, now, talking about quickly about rebates, what we're dealing with here, uh, BC Hydro is definitely the most common rebate that's accessed by builders for reaching Energite 80 on a single-family dwelling home. You can get up to $2,000. You can get $2,000 uh, if you've installed Energy Star appliances, an additional $200, and $200 for row or town homes. These rebates are getting accessed by builders all over the place. It's a super easy admin process. Just talk to a certified energy advisor about what you need to do to access them. Basically, talk to your certified energy advisor. He's going to say, OK, what's your building plans? Rate it in HOT 2000, let you know where you are, where you need to go, and how quickly you can access the rebate. Best thing about BC Hydro's rebates, the application is two pages, takes less than five minutes to do. And really, it takes four to six weeks to get a check. It's one of the best rebate programs out there, I think. Uh, Fortis BC launched an additional rebate program for natural gas-fired appliances, $200 for a power-vented gas tank, four or $500 for a tankless system, depending on the efficiency, and $1,000 for a gas-fired condensing boiler. Uh, if you're a builder in Vancouver, chances are you've installed a Wiesman system uh, with, a, with a condensing boiler and a uh, combi system for your hot water. That boiler does qualify for a $1,000 rebate. $1, rebate. Uh, every builder in Vancouver should be accessing these rebates because they have to have an energy assessment anyways. And the last rebate that's out there is $300 for each EnerChoice qualified fireplace. Uh, EnerChoice is just like an energy rating system, but for fireplaces, uh, the rebate basically breaks down to as long as the system is 65%, 64% efficient or more, it's able to access this rebate. Best thing about it is you can access this rebate if you have five fireplaces in a giant home, you can access that rebate five times. Or if you just have two in a regular sized home, you can access that rebate two times. Uh, for home buyers, there is also a rebate available through the CMHC. Um, you can get a 10% rebate on, or a refund on your mortgage loan insurance. Typically, mortgage loan insurance is for first-time home buyers or high-risk mortgages that can't afford a, a regular down payment. But definitely, it is a great bonus for first-time home buyers. I know if I was a builder and I told the home potential home buyer, "Hey, if you buy my house versus the person down the block, you're going to get 18 or 800 to 1600 dollars back." I'm betting they'd be more likely to go with my home than my competitors. Uh, the upcoming webinars, uh, the next one that we have is a lot less technical. I'm going to be talking about how to market the future-proofed home uh, and how to sell energy efficiency to an aging demographic. Uh, we know that the baby boomers are aging. People want to age in place, and they want to stay in homes until they absolutely can't anymore. But there's another concern about efficiency. Energy prices are always going up. Energy prices are uh, uh, volatile. And we are in a position where we can help home buyers, and, and specifically the aging demographic home buyers, future-proof themselves against raising energy prices. 
And the last presentation that we're going to be doing, which uh, doesn't have a set date yet due to some other presentations that are going to be run across the province, is talking about the energy saving potential uh, and how to use pre-travel thermal imaging and blower door testing to save you and your clients money. It's going to be a lot more technical. It's going to involve our thermographer, Torsten Ely, and we're going to be doing some, some diagnostic work as well as some uh, general air sealing recommendations for homes. Um, in this presentation on the slide, I have a few resources. Uh, if anybody would like a copy of the slides, uh, please just send me a quick email, and I'll email them off to you real quick. Uh, right here we have resources for a download location for the Energy Star Thermal Bypass Checklist. Uh, Green Building Advisor, which is a fantastic website, had an article talking about the Thermal Bypass Checklist from 2010. It is a little out of date, being that the checklist has been updated, but it talks uh, about a lot of the considerations that's in it and what uh, people can be worrying about and, and concerning themselves with, as well as a link to the DC Hydro and Fortis Rebate Program and the CMHC Mortgage Loan Insurance Rebate Program. Now, if you have any questions, we do have just a, about two minutes left. I'd be glad to try and answer them. If I don't know the answer, I can confer with our senior building uh, analyst here, uh, Torsten Neely, and get back to you whenever I can. But I'll open it up. If anybody has any questions, uh, please let me know. And thank you for joining.